exactly where we left off. Okay, uh, let's quickly finish the chapter just reading it, and then we'll talk about it and bring up some things and go into chapter 2. All right, chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. So the older wise word, simply we would say ways. It's on this way. <clears throat> when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. While he thought of these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, always connecting us with this Davidic line, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall spring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be, there's our key words I was asking you to look up, fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And Joseph, being raised from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife. And he knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So, uh, we, we now have, number one, the espousal. Big fancy word. You hear the word spouse in there. All right. Well, the espousal here uh, is referring to more than an engagement. They are, for all practical purposes, they are married. They're just not together yet. So they've actually entered into a covenant agreement uh, before they have uh, been intimate. And uh, um, it meant something. In, in days gone by, when somebody made a commitment to one another, it was not something you took lightly. At the point that you made what we call an engagement, but they took it much more seriously. At that point, it was a done deal. You're just waiting for all the family to get together and to have how long a wedding uh, would, would uh, be a normal thing back in Jesus' day. Days. It would be days, but we have one where Jesus shows up in John chapter 2. How long did that go on? It went on for a whole week. Now, why would they take so long to honor a wedding? It was a huge deal. Yeah, it was a huge deal. People came, and that was the time for family to get together. It was super important and super family-oriented, and it elevated the, the wedding. Not that you spent a fortune on the wedding, but you made much of the wedding. So, now... Uh, who was this Joseph guy? He was a man looking forward to marriage. He was looking forward to getting married. To marry, he was a just man, which means he was justified. He was a believer in God's word. He lived it. He was a confused man, though, when he comes to find out by this angel telling him. And would you believe a dream if, it, if some apparition told you something that was hard to believe? You'd be shaking yourself going, is this just a dream or can this angel actually be real? So he's confused and he's hurt because his wife's telling him, it's a conception by the Holy Ghost when he's like, that's not possible, and the angel was talking to him, and yet he cares. All right, so use this word. When you hear the word putting away, he wants to privily, which is, we would say, what? Priv uh, privately, all right? Privately is, uh, uh, he would have privately put her away. What does that mean? Break up the, uh, the uh, dispousal or the covenant or the marriage. Basically, it's actually a divorce. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, he's not just saying, all right, we're going to break this off. I'm going to go my way. You're going to go. No, he's already responsible when he's actually, and he says right there, uh, he says, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily, which means he was going to send her away and. Uh, he just couldn't live with this woman who had been unfaithful to him. That's what it seemed like to him. And so he's going to put her away, which means privately, maybe send her away, and he's going to finance her. I mean, her parents aren't going to accept her. So he takes responsibility for this divorce. I mean, he's totally devastated. And so he's a good man. Because he be cares a, about her. Hmm? Public disgrace then, really for Oh my goodness, him. yes. To have, especially, they've made a covenant to be together, and at that time she finds out she's pregnant. And not by him. So it is, it is incredibly defeating to him. 
So he's a committed man, and uh, uh, he would take care of her, as he, and he would still financially support her. But he was a sensitive man, which means that when God spoke to him, he responded to it. Now, there's a lot of confusion. I just really want to say this. The Catholic Church has said that Mary had to have been a temple virgin. She was dedicated laboring in the Jewish temple, which has never, that never happened. Joseph was a widower. He was an older man who already had children, which you don't get anywhere in the Bible. Mary's mother, by the way, the Catholic Church says that Mary's mother was St. Anne, and that she was also a virgin who conceived Mary also by the Holy Ghost. You know, when you start to change the Bible as, 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 as uh, miraculous as the Bible is, you can't undo one thread without actually creating bigger problems. So, uh, they needed Mary to be a perpetual virgin and they made her into the Queen of Heaven. And it is an abominable doctrine. We won't even go down there. Um, now, let's talk about the excitement. <clears throat> because what you have here is Mary is with child. And I like how the Bible says that. It doesn't say that she was pregnant. Pregnant sounds so sterile. Mary was, was, she was being with child, uh, and yet she's still a virgin, which means that she's got this birth by the Holy Ghost. Now, I know in this day and age, there are all kinds of, of uh, um, surgical things that they, they induce and, and create uh, what they call pregnancies and things. Um, uh, it, it was just fantastical what uh, Mary is now believing. Did she have a problem with believing what the angel told her that she was going to have a baby even though she didn't know a man? Did she have a problem with that? Yeah, she had to ponder the things in her heart. Well, did, yeah. Was it, was it hard and impossible for her to believe? I'm using maybe a, not the right extreme. Not impossible. She actually, now it was John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, who said, that's not her. We're old. We're not going to have children. I don't believe you. It's basically what he's saying. And the angel says, well, you will believe. And to prove that I should have been believed, you're going to be dumb for the next nine months. And he, so, but when, when uh, Mary hears the angel, she says, be it unto thine hand, me. So be it. She believes. And, and, and so she's excited. And the Holy Ghost is involved throughout your Bible. You'll find it first in creation. It says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the earth. You'll find the Spirit, it says, my Spirit will not always strive with man, trying to keep him under control. You'll find him in the life of the Messiah in Isaiah 42. And you'll find him in the life of the believer, aren't you, Galetta? Uh, you'll find the Holy Spirit working in the remnant of the Jews during the tribulation. And here, you'll find him in the supernatural conception of a baby. So it's a total surprise that Mary is with child. And there's a big convert. Uh, uh, there's a big uh, uh, criticism of the word virgin. And most new Bibles translate, instead of uh, Isaiah 7.14, where you find uh, prophecy, instead of it being the word virgin, they use the word young girl. <laughs> a young girl will be the child. Like, that's a miracle. Or a young maiden. But they don't like the word virgin. Or right here I got an RSV, a young woman. Now, I'm just going to just pass this over real quick and just say that uh, uh, it wouldn't have been, for, for any young lady to have a baby is not a miracle. And yet that's the whole point. I mean, here's, uh, here's Matthew say, oh, this is the fulfillment of a prophecy that a girl is going to have a baby. That can't be a prophecy. That can't be. It has to be a virgin would be with child. So the whole concept here in Matthew is bringing that out. Um, uh, there is a, there is a, a um, uh, problem you're going to have when you deal with, with uh, Jews and when you deal with modern people. And that is a rejection of the miraculous. Now, why do people have a problem with miracles? We all pray for them. But why do people have a problem with miracles in the Bible? There was a president of the United States, the second president of the United States, his name was Thomas Jefferson. He edited the King James Bible. He cut out all the things that he believed in and, and left the rest of it holes. And he only told the story of Jesus with no miracle. Okay. I think I'm more confused. This was it. Um, 
So uh, why would why would um, people be afraid of miracles? Look, if they haven't seen it for themselves. Um, yeah, no, a little bit more than that. Um, I'm going to figure out how to get that picture. Um, most, seeing is believing. Seeing is believing, yes, but more importantly, people have abused the use of miracles. What do I mean by that? Miracles. Miraculous. I think I've wrote up my own. Um, yeah, people claim to do it in the name of God, but the name of Jesus, but they're not. And, well, when you've seen a lot of hustlers make fun of the miracles and, and turn them into shows, people run away from the miracles. They don't believe in miracles anymore. So people don't mind God, but they do mind miracles. Was there anybody in the Old Testament, I'm sorry, in the New Testament, in Matthew even, that had a problem with God being involved in human, in human uh, affairs? Was there anybody that um, just had problems with believing that God would, would uh, care and, and, and do miracles? In Matthew? In Matthew. What do you think, Darren? How about the Sadducees? They did not believe in the miracles, they believed in the resurrection. And so they were a very powerful political religious group that had no time for miracles. And so, as a matter of fact, when, when um, uh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, guess what the Pharisees wanted to do to Lazarus? Kill him! Because they didn't, they didn't want to accept that a notable miracle had actually occurred. So I'm just showing you that when, when they come to verses that say a virgin having a, a, a birth and the miraculous fulfillment of prophecies, they mess with it, they edit it, and they change the Bibles, and they change their preaching. Number three, we have the hurt. Uh, Joseph has a hard time believing Mary's tale, no matter how much Bible you may believe. Life has a way of uh, uh, being harder to overlook. Now, he had fallen in love with a virgin who was supposed to save herself from him. He knew of only one way for Mary to get pregnant, and Joseph himself said, it wasn't me. And so, he, he's trying to figure out what to do. And number four, the exhortation. God dispatches his top angel, he calls him the angel of the Lord. And he says, fear not to do what, what you want to do. Fear not to take him to you, uh, Mary. Uh, against everything. Now, is, is, there, is there a risk in taking Mary to be his wife, Mona? Yes. Why? Oh, I know there is. Well, um, I don't know what I'm saying. Okay, what do you think? Uh, uh, now, Sorry, what was the question again? Well, is there a risk in Joseph going ahead and marrying uh, Mary. Yes, because the two of them should normally come together when they're married. Correct. But that's not going to be checked on. Like people, nosy people, they find out nine months later she has a baby and they will calculate back and go, wow, that's awfully quick for them getting mm -hmm. married so quick. So. And the risk was how long is she pregnant? Is she going to show? And yet we're going. All of that is going to come out, or possibly, as a matter of fact, there's the hint that the Pharisees throw against Jesus. And they, they accuse him, they say, we be not born of fornication like you are, which was a slam saying, we know about your mother's history. So people, people calculated, watched a number of days and, uh, and calculated out uh, because they expected, and there was pressure, we kind of make fun of it, but I kind of miss some of that, that we have a, we need to have a bit of pressure from society to keep people pure until the wedding night. So, uh, there, was, there was some risk, and yet the angel says, go ahead anyway. Number five, the fulfillment. The fulfillment. Now, uh, 
This is a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14. And uh, you're going to call this name, this boy's name Jesus. Uh, Jesus is actually two words. Jehovah is, it's actually three, but salvation. Or if you want to be real brief, it's Jehovah saves. That's what Jesus means. So when, when he said you're going to call him Jesus, it was to say Jesus saves, Jehovah saves. It's a pretty powerful name. So we have a fulfillment. Um, and just to remind you that his, his name is also Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Uh, now, so you had number six, the endurance. You know, uh, Joseph's a great man. He endured his lack of faith. He just went ahead and, and you know, obeyed the Lord. He endured the embarrassment of an instant early marriage because it says he, uh, uh, he got up. He, um, verse 24, he got up from sleep. He went and got his wife and got married, and they got married that day. Which must have been very disappointing to the family, wouldn't it have been? They didn't have a big wedding. Uh, but he, he went ahead and did it, and he endured another 10-month wait before the real marriage began. Was it able to be close to her intimately? Number seven, the endearment. The endearment. Verse 25, uh, uh, think about Joseph looking down at that newborn baby and calling him Jesus. Now, this was not his son, but everything here is pure. Notice, notice it says, well, they both, he, they both called him uh, Jesus, uh, both so Mary and Joseph, but in an official way, as soon as the baby's born, they have a, a big ceremony, and the father comes out, and like, you know, like still in, in some cultures, and yeah, I know some people, they announce the, the, the name, it's usually the father who announces it, so Mary's also going to call him, so there's no disagreement in the family. But I want you to see, and he knew or not, till she had brought forth, it says, her firstborn son. So that implies that they're going to have more children. As a matter of fact, they certainly will. Uh, it, all you have to do is go to uh, Matthew chapter 13, and it says, are not his brethren and his sisters here with us? So he's not dealing, uh, they're not talking about his disciples or his cousins. They're his brothers and sisters. All right, so uh, I want you to now if you've got uh, some study questions in there. If you got study questions on the next page that are all blanks. Keep going. Okay, good. On this, I need you to fill those out by next week. You're going to want to uh, uh, review those because those, that, that's, that's not a test, but those are preparing you for a quiz that we'll have soon. Let's get into chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And you're going to think that we're going so fast, because we are. Uh, but if you've got any questions, ask away. I just want to try to uh, stay on track here. Chapter 2 in Matthew it begins with a big bang, right? Sorry, just one fill in there on page 16. The firstborn son of God, all of these are what? Sons of God? Are younger. Younger? I forgot that that name filled in. If Jesus is the firstborn, he's the oldest. He's not the only son of God, is he? No. Because I'm also born again into the family of God. I'm also a son of God. He's the older brother in the family of God. That's a crazy thing, but that's how God treats us as family. So he's firstborn, we're younger brethren in the family. All right, so we now get into uh, wise men worshiping. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem. In the land of Judah are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, he inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. 
And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when he had found him, Bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed below the star, which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All right, as we come into chapter 2, we have, I mean, you just got to say, uh, nobody was ever born when Jesus was. All right? <clears throat> we find out in Luke, Luke tells us that Jesus was born in a manger, which is a feeding trough. And, uh, but we come out here in, in uh, uh, Luke says manger, uh, which means he's out in a, in a shed somewhere. Some people say a cave where, where animals are kept. Uh, he's, he's with the animals. In, in Matthew, yeah, it says come into the house. There we go. Now we're in a house. So I'm trying to tell you that when you spot differences, there are different times. This is much later, maybe six months later. We don't know because that's why that's why Herod asks and says, "About what time did you see this star? When do you expect this baby to have been born?" Because very soon he's actually going to send an army in and wipe out every child that's two years old and younger. So just because it's his house and another time it's his manger, don't get confused saying, well, which one is it? No, he was born in a manger. But can you imagine if it's weeks or months later, Joseph would have gotten a house by then. Joseph would have rented a house. Mm -hmm. Joseph would be staying. He would be living still in that manger. And uh, it wasn't the... Uh, the same night. We always have a Christmas play and we always show the wise men coming in at the night of his birth. But it wasn't that way. It was later on. So, <clears throat> wise men worship Jesus. The wise men were called magi. Now, that's a very technical term. When you hear the word magi, what other word does that become if you, if you keep working on it? Magic. <laughs> Magic. Alright. Or magician. Alright. So, does that mean these guys were magicians saying, uh, uh, you know, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. No, no that's why the King James translators used that, that, they took that word magi, and they said, no, these are wise men. That meant that they were, they were the scientists of the day. They were very careful. They analyzed uh, patterns in astronomy. They, they read books from all over the world. They read the Old Testament. When, when it says that they were wise men from the East, would they have originally been from an Eastern religion? Or Probably. So if you've got if you got the Mediterranean Sea here and you've got Israel here, okay? And um, when it comes from the east, you're coming from this direction, going west. Okay? So what's over here? What are the countries that are in, in your mind? Persia. Okay, so you got Persia up here. We've got Saudi Arabia down here. Well it's just called Arabia back then. Okay? You've got all of these. You've got all of these lands that are now modern Iran and Iraq. Let's see Iraq here and Iran here. Modern day Persia, and so it's from this area. And there's one big capital city right here. If you remember in history, church history is uh, or, or Bible history is really influential. It's called Babylon. Yeah. Okay. Where who, who ended up in Babylon? Who was taken captive in Babylon and made such an impression on the kings, Nebuchadnezzar, the Cyrus, and uh, Darius? Daniel. Daniel lives in Babylon over 70 years. He influences Babylon with the Old Testament. He teaches them uh, about the prophecies in the Old Testament. He himself is intrigued by the prophecies of the coming Messiah. He writes one of the most important prophetic books in the entire Bible, the book of Daniel. So these men coming from the East have the book of Daniel. They have sections of the Old Testament. They are students of every religion, of every book they can get their hand on. And they are influenced by a star appearing that matches prophecies in our Bible. Okay, so uh, we talk about the East. <clears throat> the, East the, the East has many wise men. Uh, a guy comes from, from Ur, or, or sorry, uh, uh, the land of Uz. His name is Job. 
He's from the east. Um, you have uh, Ur up here. Actually, sorry, Ur is down here if you get your map. Ur is down by the Tigris River. Ur of the Chaldees. Who grows up in Ur? And comes out of it. It's called out of Ur. And he's told to go to the promised land. Abraham. Okay, so we don't write off the east. The east is a very important place. As a matter of fact, Solomon is said to be wiser than all the wise men of the east because they were very wise. They were known to be so wise. So uh, we, we figure they're from the Babylonian air, area uh, as the best guess. Now the search. They go searching for this newborn king. And what they use for their search is a star. And Genesis 49 says a star will appear. Uh, um, the, there's a prophecy about um, a star appearing in the direction of Israel. And actually, uh, there's several. Numbers chapter 24 uh, has a, uh, a guy who talked to a donkey. Remember his name? Balaam? Balaam. Right? Balaam makes a prophecy about a Messiah coming and he would have a star associated with his birth. Now, um, there is... Uh, uh, the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 saying that from the time the, the temple was rebuilt until the Messiah is 483 years. So they have calculated what he's going to be king. Let's, look, we've seen a star. Maybe he's born. Now it's about 30 years early. So it's like another, we were talking about the 490, the 490 yes. was like, so that's mm -hmm. another. That's right. He actually calls it 70 weeks determined to finish off Israel's history. And, and to complete it and to bring in righteousness. And 70 weeks, 70 times that was 490. But the last week of years, the last seven years, is actually in the tribulation. And so it's 439, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 480, 490 years, minus that was 483 years, is 483 years until the Messiah gets cut off. And they see the star, and I'm just making a conjecture, they see the star, and they see the prophecy, well, maybe he's born now. Maybe he's 30 years early, and he was. He's 33 years early for when Jesus comes riding on that donkey into Jerusalem, he comes on the very day predicted by Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. Exact to the day. So they're going, all right, this must be the birth of the king. If he's going to be about 30 years old when he's king, let's go find the birth. That's why they call him king when he's born, because uh, Daniel calls it, calls it, uh, calls the Messiah the king. So uh, <clears throat> I got all kinds. Matthew directly cites or alludes to Old Testament scriptures 129 times. I'll have you look up 25 of them. There are 63. Here's your fill-in prophecies in Mark and 100. Prophetic references in Luke. I give you some of them in those next charts. Now, the focus of their search is to worship. What do you come to church for? What do you read your Bible for? What do you do anything for? Is it to worship? They also come to worship Jesus. They didn't come to worship Mary or even Jehovah. They came to worship this man child, Jesus Christ, just like Jehovah is worshiped. In, 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 in these scriptures, and we don't have time to look at them, every time it says somebody worshipped Jesus, worshipped, worshipped, and Jesus never stopped them. Now, when somebody tried to worship Paul, guess what he did? He says, I'm a man like you are. When Cornelius bowed down and tried to worship Peter, what did Peter say? No. <laughs> no, he said, get up, I am a man like unto you, do not worship me. Uh, the Apostle John, in the vision of looking at the future in Revelation, he gets so overwhelmed, he falls down and starts worshiping this angel. And the angel nearly kicks him and says, Get up, worship God. Don't worship me. So worship doesn't belong to anybody except God. And yet, Jesus allowed people to worship him, which means he's God. Okay? Um, and you'll always find Mary listed after Jesus. Always Jesus and Mary, not Mary and Jesus. That's an important fact for the Catholics. Now, there was trouble in the search. If you remember there, it says, um, verse 3, it says, when Herod heard, had heard all these things that these wise men were there, and I don't think there were just three. I'm sure there might have been as many as 10 or 20. Um, and they come with a huge number of, of uh, camels and stuff, because they've traveled forever, 
uh, uh, through the desert. But when, when Herod hears about this entourage, and they're not looking for him, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem is troubled with him. So Jesus is stirred up trouble even at his birth. Amen? Now, there's lack of information here. Uh, Herod here is Herod the Great, which means there are two Herods. The first Herod is this man. The second Herod is the Herod that actually later on has John the Baptist killed. By the way, they're father and son, and they're pretty evil. Uh, when it says Herod the Tetrarch, it means Herod the king of a fourth. He had a small part of this area uh, in, in Palestine. Um, this is the guy who actually fixed up um, the temple in Christ's day. Now, Herod knew where to go looking for the answer. When he called for the, when the wise men came along and they, uh, and they said, where is the king? Um, where does Herod go to find out where, where Jesus is born? Where does he go, uh, yeah, the scribes? When he calls the scribes, and where do they turn to? The scripture. The scriptures. You know, Herod's more of a Bible believer than more people, than most people are. He, know, he knew if, I, if, if this is the king, these guys will know because they've got the scriptures. So, the wise men had prophecy up to the book of Daniel in their possession, but they didn't have the book of Micah. So let's go to Micah chapter 5. Hold your place here in Matthew. I want you to see Micah in the Old Testament. It's right after the book of Jonah. Small little books. So if you go to Malachi, Matthew and go left, you'll have to go about 30 pages back and you'll find the book of Micah. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Thou Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Bethlehem is the city, Ephrathah is the region, like a county. Though thou be little as a tiny town among the thousands of towns of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, God talking, that is to be ruler in Israel. Now note these words. I want you to tell me the difference between this and Matthew. Um, Whose goings forth have been from of old from how long? So wherever this guy's coming from, he's coming out of eternity. Let's go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 2, when these uh, scribes quote the Bible, and they quote from Malachi, meant from Micah. Verse 5, and they said unto him, uh, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, that shall rule my people Israel. And what do they do at the end of that sentence? They put a full stop. But they don't quote the rest of Micah 5, which says, this is somebody who's coming from everlasting. So, here's the point. There are a lot of people who have a Bible. There are people who know the Bible, but they don't believe the Bible. And when these scribes are, are quoting what Micah says, they only quote to a point, and they go, yeah, but we don't really believe he's eternal. Because would you believe that somebody who's going to be born is actually eternal? So you understand where they're coming from, and yet God doesn't expect you to. Uh, good evening. God doesn't expect you uh, to, um, uh, you know, to understand. He expects you to believe. So we're we're now in the where the star comes up, and um, uh, just rushing through. Let me just get through this thing here. Uh, it says that when they finished, in verse 9, it says, when they, had heard, when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, that star which they saw in the east went before them. What does that imply? <clears throat> that it's moving. Okay? I don't know how it is. I mean, you got, you got landscape, and you got these, you got these guys, and, and these guys are walking along, and they see a star somewhere up in the sky, and that thing is moving in a direction away from Jerusalem, northwest, no, sorry, northeast, because out of Jerusalem it's headed up to Bethlehem. And so it's changed direction. Well, it's actually, they, it, it disappeared for a while when they came to Jerusalem. Now they see it again, and it's going to be hanging over where Jesus is born. And so this, they're following this bright object in the sky. Any, any idea what that object was? Where are you from? 
More than the glory of God, it actually probably was an angel. A, a, just when the angels appear, they, uh, they are brilliant in the sky. Um, uh, they're brilliant in heaven. They shine. When Jesus on, uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he shone brilliantly in surprise of sun, but angels have the ability to shine. As a matter of fact, Job chapter 38 says that when God created the earth, the morning stars sang. And the angels, he's talking about the sons of God, the angels, singing. And he calls them stars. So if, would, sorry? The, would the star have, right, the star would have been there to guide the shepherds to the birth room? Mm -hmm. no, the, the star that was there. To guide the wise men the to wise the birth. Yes. Right, so then there was a good um, gap between Jesus' birth and the actual I'm getting mixed up now. Mm -hmm. You were saying they found him maybe six months later after he was born? We, we, I'm giving him plenty of time. We don't know. He, uh, he may be just a few weeks old. He may be a few months old. All we know is that when, when the wise men don't return to Herod, Herod's furious and he adds up all the time that they say they saw his star, which applied to birth. So they come after the birth. And when they leave, he gives them plenty of time to come back and tell them, because he wanted them to tell them where the, the, baby, the child was born. And they don't come back, and he gets furious, and he says, kill all the infants two years old and younger. So he's, he's giving it plenty of time. Don't think it's just within a few days or a few weeks. It's, it's, it's at least some time from the time that the star appears. They come at least one month that they trek without stopping. So the star was there quite a while? Quite a while. Yeah. Yes. It was there, and it, I don't think it moved while they uh, came from the east, but when they're in Jerusalem, it's not there. But as soon as they finish hearing what the Bible said, that he would be born in Jerusalem, they go back out, bingo, there's a star that is heading northeast, and they follow it up to Jerusalem. And so I'm telling you, this star is moving. So it's not a ball of hydrogen gas up in the, up in the starry sky. It's an angel, because it's moving, and it stops and hovers right over um, the, uh, the birthplace. <clears throat> so, verse 10, oh, sorry, and uh, uh, verse 9 says, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. It was leading them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Now, I would have been thrilled at looking at the star moving. But they didn't care about the star, they cared about what the star was signifying. Um, uh, I, I'm surprised that people don't get the idea that uh, everybody over in Hollywood wants to be called a what? Yeah. A star. <laughs> uh, what city do they live in? Los Angeles, mm -hmm. city of angels. Isn't that funny how they make a mockery of, of the Bible, the concept of who's really a star, mm -hmm. um, focusing on Jesus Christ. So we got a star here, and uh, I got some theories of why nobody else saw the star. Number one, most people don't look up. Very few people care about astronomy, uh, stars in the sky, who cares? I gotta go plant tomorrow. I gotta go uh, take my kid in uh, and, and, and uh, find somebody who will help me with some herb or something. He's had a cold for a week. They're so burdened by problems, they don't have time to look at the stars. These guys noticed it, okay? Now I encourage you, we should not neglect the beauty, the heavens declare the glory of God. So, <clears throat> do you think the star was shining, or the angel was shining straight down onto the location? Well, he's actually, they can see it, but it is actually, I put it over here, I was saying that it was moving, it actually went right over where Jesus was, and then, so it's hovering over, so it's beautifully bright in all directions. We kind of, you know, we, we go, and there's always a chorus of angels singing, you know, when you have this, this light shining over the bird. And it may, it doesn't say. So we never know. We don't know. No, no, no. Uh, kinda, yeah. We kind of yeah. embellish it. I just know the star was hovering over the birthplace. Maybe 100 meters right. up. Yeah. Doesn't have to be very high. So it was moving along, and that's where it stopped. And stopped. then it stops. Oh. All right? First GPS. Okay. Yeah. All right? Now, <clears throat> uh, number five. Notice they were in a house, not in a stable anymore. So we already talked about that. Number B, <clears throat> Jesus is taken to Egypt for safety. Now, uh, verse 12 says, And being warned of God in a dream that they should uh, not return to Herod, they departed to, unto their own country another way. 
Now, where was their own country, dear? Where was both Mary and Joseph from? Oh, boy, from Nazareth. Nazareth. So he wants to go home. Let's go take you know the kid up to see Grandma. Amen. When you want to, you got a kid. You got a, your, your son's having a, a child. You want to see the grandson. And so he's trying to go home, but he doesn't make it. It says there, verse 12, it says, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed, I'm sorry, into the own country, verse 13, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appears again to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee now into where? Now you're running into Egypt now. Be thou there till I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So what was coming was a was a, a, a slaughter. The uh, Herod was going. If he heard that Jesus was up in Nazareth, he would have killed every child up in Nazareth. So the, he takes him out of country. Uh, verse fourteen. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, um, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So who came out of Egypt in your Bible? There's more than just one. Moses. Um, well, be more specific. Not just Moses. Moses wasn't the only one that came out of, out of Egypt. Who else? Was it Joseph? Oh, yes. Israelites. What did you say? Israelites. Israelites. The Jews were freed. And they came out and came to the promised land. And you know what's funny? That event was a picture not of just salvation, but we find here that God put, sent his own son into Egypt so he could call him out of Egypt. So Jesus particularly has to come out of Egypt. Now, I guarantee you, Joseph had no idea what fulfillment he was doing by following this thing out. But Jesus is called out of Egypt to fulfill the scripture in the Old Testament. Out of Egypt have I called my son. So Joseph has a dream, and I want to say this. There are some times that you ought to run. You know, when, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's some times when the Holy Spirit just says, don't stand, don't fight, it's time to run. <laughs> time to lead, time to call it quits. And they're running for their lives, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now, Egypt is a type of who or what? Egypt is a type, a symbol, it's an illustration of what? The world. So everything about Egypt, everything about Egypt has a comparison to our world cultures. So the Bible talks about love not the world, leave the things in the world. Egypt, beautiful, um, a mighty, powerful. Um, it was uh, a great empire. Everything about it was wrong. God didn't want his people in because they were slaves in Egypt. They were not free. They only they they were they were abused, and they were they were um, uh, they were neglected. They were seen as nobodies. They were they were uh, I could list twenty five things. Doesn't matter. But I'm just saying, God wanted to pull them out of there. And so when we are in our world, our world may look beautiful, our world may, when I say world, I'm talking about the sunrise and sunset and the dirt, we're talking about the culture. Our world may seem beautiful, I'm not sorry today, it may seem so, so inviting, especially to young people, but it enslaves. It never lets you be free. If you're going to follow God, you're going to have to come out of the world. Now one of these days we will actually literally go out of the world, maybe. It's called the rapture, or when if you die, you are coming out of Egypt, amen? But Jesus is, is uh, using an illustration to prove that he wants his people out of Egypt. And ultimately, that's why the, the concept, one of these times, uh, Christians are going to come out of Egypt in the future at the rapture, okay? I'm looking forward to that day. Now, Herod massacres all the children in Bethlehem. Verse 16, it goes on and says, uh, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked to the wise men, he was exceeding wroth, and he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof. So he doesn't just go in door to door to Bethlehem and find infants. 
he goes into all of the regions around. It'd be like, it'd be like coming to Mount Colic and then going out to ovens and going down to, I don't know, how far down you want to go, and up to Blarney. He went through all the region around and slew from two years old and under because that was the amount of time that had passed according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. And then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children would not be comforted because they are not. So there's a prophecy in the Old Testament there in Jeremiah 31. In Jeremiah 31, he's talking about a woman who's dead at that point. Hmm. Over a thousand years. Well, not quite. I don't think it might Yeah, over a thousand years. And uh, Rachel was married to who? Who's Rachel married to? Jacob. Jacob. Now, uh, Rachel is Jacob's favorite wife. Okay? Now, she has two children. Anybody remember those two children's names? Uh, hmm? Joseph. Joseph, ben excellent. Benjamin. And Benjamin. All right, Joseph and Benjamin. Now, there's a prophecy about Rachel, even though she's dead, and a prophecy saying Rachel's going to cry one day that her children, her descendants, are going to be dead, going to be slaughtered. And this is given us in, in Jeremiah chapter 31, that Rachel would be sorrowful about, now it says, uh, in that Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Bethlehem is in the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was swallowed up by the tribe of Judah, if you, if you follow any of the ins and outs of the laying out of the, the land. And these are the descendants of Benjamin, which is uh, swallowed up. It's part of Judah, but it's a section in, it'd be like, um, uh, what range? Of, well, okay, it's like, of course, it's inside Munster, okay? And so the region of Ephrata is actually part of Benjamin, even though it's in Jerusalem. And their descendants, hundreds of children, are slaughtered all over that. And Rachel, even though she's dead, she will weep. So, um, now, uh, it's, it's, it's just, uh, you know, this would just blow you away to hear about this in the news that Herod could get away with this, that Herod could actually slaughter. But that's what despots were. And that's why we have such freedom today because we fought against absolute power in kings and in Democrats. <clears throat> anyway. Now, um, you know, I want you to look at number four. Uh, the cost of Jesus interfering in human history? Because Jesus interferes, uh, Satan always moves to destroy. And it costs those children their lives. But it's the only way. Uh, remember when you rejected the guilt and, and God working on your heart? Remember when, when the devil made your life miserable? Not the devil. When, when God made your life miserable, bringing you conviction? That's a good thing. Sometimes when the, when the Lord humbles you, pulls a rug out from under you when you're lost, it's because he's going after you. And there's a cost. Um, and I thank God for God humbling me and embarrassing me and shaming me uh, into understanding that I'm a sinner. So these are the costs of the devil fighting um, the birth of the Messiah. He does not want Jesus to, to be allowed to live. Now, number D, Jesus returns to Nazareth, verse 19. <clears throat> But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose, and he took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judah, Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Now, what's he afraid of? What do you think, Allison? The angel says you can go home. What's he afraid of? Guess where, guess where he's trying to go? I, I'll give you a... Um, where do you think he wants to go? Um, no. Nope. He knows there's money to be made in the big city in Jerusalem. And he's heading back. And the angel says you can return now into the land of Israel. Go anywhere you want. But fear hits him. And so he says, well, I can't go to Jerusalem because Archelaus is there. And I don't want Archelaus to know that... 
that family that left at the time of his father slaughtering that, those children. So he heads back home. So, you know, sometimes we, we grew up in the back of beyond. He was probably thinking like father, like, father, like son. The king yes. after the king and supported his And he's going to be coming after him. And so, but he, I, I think that he wanted out of the little town and he loved, listen, how long did he live possibly in, in um, uh, Bethlehem area just off of Jerusalem? How long do you think he lived there? At least up till a year before he flees. Okay, because it's after two years that all the children are slaughtered. So while he's there, I guarantee you, he's only eight miles from Jerusalem. He's making money as a carpenter. Left, right, and center. And so he's wanted to go maybe back to Bethlehem. And he finds out Archelaus is in power, so he heads back to the little bitty backwoods town called Nazareth. Yeah. Um, I don't think Jesus he wanted to go there. Be, be in Nazareth to fulfill one of the prophecies. You yeah. got it, girl. So sometimes our fears and everything go on, we don't know what to do. God still uses your mess ups and your fears, and you don't know what. God's still directing your steps. Thank God, thank God. Anyway, he returns to Nazareth. Um, and uh, verse 22, go on. And when he heard that Archelaus the reign of Judea in the room of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go thither any further. Understand, uh, notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside unto the parts now of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now let me um, make a statement here about Jesus' teenage years, uh, uh, just because Joseph, uh, just because Matthew doesn't record it, um, it's not in Matthew, but it is pretty cool to know that we, we, we cover in Matthew the birth of Jesus. And the next time we see him uh, in, 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 in chapter 4, I'll give you one, uh, give me a guess as to how old he is when he shows up and he's ready to be baptized. When he started his ministry. When he started his ministry, when he's tempted, there's the, what we call the temptation before the baptism, forgive me. Uh, how old is he at the temptation? He's about 30 years old. So that's quite a gap, wouldn't you think? Well, Luke fills in and says, at 12 years old, we find him. Every year his parents go three times to the temple, and they take Jesus with them, and when he's 12 years old, he stumps the warriors. I love stumping lawyers. Wouldn't that be cool? Mm -hmm. And he says, I should be about my father's business. At 12 years old, did Jesus know he was the Messiah? Yes. yes. It didn't just dawn on him in the baptism. There are a lot of modern commentators who will say Jesus didn't know that he was the Son of God until he was baptized on this rubbish. Mm -hmm. Now he knew it. The, 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 the wise men knew it. Uh, the scripture said he was ruler, everything about him. So even at 12 years old, he knew he was a Messiah. He was just very humble. He didn't go around asking to be carried, but he knew how to blow people away. And he was doing his father's business. He wouldn't just show off. He was making them think about the prophecies about the Messiah. Okay. And do you think because Matthew kind of jumped from the birth and the next uh, mention was, it, was here. when he was about 30, was the birth? And then Luke mentions him when he was 12. They're just focusing on different things? Yes. Luke's actually, Luke's one of the most complete stories, start to finish, of the life of Christ. Okay? But Matthew doesn't really want to give the whole story because, I mean, you imagine all the things you have to list. The book of Matthew would be bigger than the Bible if you're trying to show all the things. As a matter of fact, that's what John says. If all the things that Jesus did were written down, the books, all the books of the world couldn't contain all of it. So there was constant stuff going on around Jesus. So Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, jumps right to the important thing, the testing of the Messiah. Is he really the Son of God? Is he really impeccable? Is he perfect? Is he sinless? So he jumps to that because this is inconsequential to a Jew. A Jew doesn't care about a kid to a person. Because this is the theme of Matthew's book, as you were saying. Yes. To prove Jesus as the Messiah. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. So, starting to make sense. <laughs> well, the pieces will fall together. So, do your best at answering study questions at the end of each one of these chapters, uh, chapter one, and now just a brief there, chapter two, in preparation. In the next few weeks, you will have a, a quiz, uh, maybe even next week, so I would be ready for it. Okay, we will stop there. It was just 
one fell in and didn't. Oh, sorry. Uh, what was it? I'm racing and I apologize. There is so much here. I don't know how I taught it better last time. You probably covered it now. Number five, page, house. Page 18, uh, question 2A. There was one, two, and three. Job, Abraham, and Yes, Job, Abraham, and Solomon's. I'm Solomon's sorry about that. Wisdom. Solomon's wisdom was able to exceed the wisdom of the East, implying that the East had some of the greatest minds of all time. 